What would you say if I told you that arguably the best rocket ever designed isn't some modern reusable SpaceX launch vehicle, it's not that rocket that took humans to the moon, it's not even that one that evolved to walk upright like a man. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck? No, I think the best one that we've ever cooked up that doesn't use any speculative ideas so we know it would definitely work is one that was designed way before Apollo. It uses quite possibly the most hilarious method of generating thrust I've ever heard of. It's one of those ideas that sounds incomprehensibly stupid at first glance, but it's so stupid it goes full circle and comes back to being absolutely genius. I'm referring to Project Orion, a rocket that rides on a wave of nuclear explosions. Let's talk about it. So at first glance, nuclear weapons and transportation aren't closely related. Inventing nukes and turning them into a means of transportation is like inventing a cure for Parkinson's and turning it into a sausage packaging machine. Just kind of hard to envision how that would work. Even nuclear powered transportation in general doesn't really have an obvious way to do it. Like, can you imagine the first guy that came up with this idea trying to explain it to someone else? So yeah, like what's the plan? A small nuclear reactor with fuel rods and shit and ultimately boils water and turns a turbine and makes electricity and uses the electricity to turn wheels that push you forwards? Nah man, you're thinking way too hard about this. Oh, so it's like a nuclear generator type thing. No, again, way too complicated. Remember when there was that hurricane coming and a certain someone suggested bombing it? Yeah, that's the level of complete and utter retardation I'm looking for. What, like, just stand on top of a nuclear bomb and blow it the f*** up? Yeah, that's pretty much the answer I was looking for. Why do I feel like that wouldn't work? Because you touch yourself at night. Okay, so let me set the scene. It's 19 something or other and we've split the atom already, but no one really has a space program yet, and it hasn't taken long for a few physicists to put two and two together on this one. The physicists go to DARPA, say the words space and explosions while someone stands behind them making bald eagle noises and DARPA's like You son of a bitch, I'm in! And so Project Orion was born, a study to see how feasible the idea of nuclear explosion powered space transportation would be, funded to the tune of 1 million crisp 1958 American dollars per year. So here's the big idea, put a crew compartment on top of a container, fill the container with a whole lot of small low yield nuclear fission devices that are each about the size of a coke can, have a hole in the bottom of the container and a feeder mechanism that pushes them out one at a time at regular intervals. You want to like a couple of them out per second, that kind of thing. Explosion under ship, ship go fast. It's actual cartoon logic. Now I imagine you have some concerns with this plan, such as how does this not kill everyone and everything for a variety of reasons. First off, it's important to mention the pusher plate. The pusher plate is the fission pulse drive's way of dampening the impact. Kind of looks like a piston block from Minecraft if it had a pterodactyl's cloaca in the middle of it. The pusher plate needs to be thick enough to tank a lot of nukes to the face and dense enough to absorb the truly awful quantity of ionizing radiation that's going to be involved. It's also on giant shock absorbers that turned the near instant acceleration from trying to ride a nuclear explosion like a roller coaster into something approximately survivable by a human. If it didn't have the pusher plate and the shock absorbers it would absolutely accelerate in very short, almost instantaneous bursts of about 10,000 Gs. But the shock absorbers are tuned to spread the force as evenly as possible across time, making it feel more like continuous acceleration, ideally. I've heard that astronauts who have ridden on both the Soyuz and the Falcon 9 say that the Falcon 9 is comparatively quite a rough ride, so I'd hate to hear how they describe Describe the nuclear pogo stick trying its best not to turn their spine into a pile of dust. Sorry to interrupt, this is just a quick message to say, statistically speaking, you're probably not subscribed, so I'll make you a deal. Press the subscribe button and I won't come over to your house and do this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yo, Jeremy, check out this lighter trick. Alright, thanks. Back to the video. So there's two main things to bear in mind when it comes to rocket engines, right? There's thrust and there's efficiency. A rocket engine basically just chucks mass out the back of a spaceship really fast and the equal and opposite force it applies to the rocket pushes the rocket in the other direction. If you're throwing something to move, you can either throw a big thing and you'll only be able to throw it fairly slowly because it's big, it's a big massive thing, or you can throw a small thing but that thing you can throw more quickly, right? Either way, in an equivalent scenario you can make it so that you produce the same amount of force in either scenario. Of course this is a metaphor for rockets but what Whatever, roll with me on this. Depending on the type of rocket engine, it tends either to want to do the equivalent of throw a boulder load of sh** out the back very quickly so it speeds you up very quickly, in other words, it has a crap load of thrust, or they tend to want to spend all day shooting loogies through a paper straw which takes forever to get you up to speed, but since all those small particles you're firing out go faster than the one big lump you threw all at once, if you eventually get to the point where you fired out the same amount of mass doing it this way as you had doing it that way, you will have produced more force overall the second way. It just takes longer to get you up to speed. 
that's pretty much the dynamic with different types of rocket engines. It's first stage rocket engines on one end of the spectrum, which is very exciting for 10 seconds until it runs out of fuel, and ion engines on the other end of the spectrum, which can shoot out electrons at a significant fraction of the speed of light, which sounds exciting until you die of old age waiting for the fucking thing to actually move you anywhere. The reason that Project Orion style nuclear pulse engines were a genuinely awesome idea, and to be honest, still would be an incredible idea, is that they're simultaneously ridiculously high thrust and ridiculously high efficiency. We hadn't even left the atmosphere yet, and these guys were seriously considering the logistics of a mission to Saturn using this goddamn thing. The ISP these things have is insane. Most rocket engines have an ISP of a few hundred seconds, but this thing's like, oh, Zan, it, mm, yeah? The f is ISP? Oh, uh, specific impulse? It's just a measure of how efficient your rocket engines are, and it's measured in seconds? How does that make sense? It, yeah, it does make sense, you just don't get- Could you explain it? Listen, I could spend the next 10 minutes going over it, or you could just trust me and then we both get to use those 10 minutes to do something meaningful like hug a loved one, or eat a block of cheese, or frantically whack one out in the shower. Yeah, f*** it, trust me. The more seconds of specific impulse, the more efficient the rocket engine, that's all you need to know. For reference, the F1 engines on the Saturn V had an ISP of about 265 seconds. That's how efficient they were, 265. The Merlin engine on the Falcon 9 has about 350 seconds. It's similar for the Raptor engines on the Starship, except the vacuum optimized ones can hit about 380, but the original crappiest version of the nuclear pulse drive design would have had a specific impulse of about 2,000 seconds. Later designs got it up to between 4 and 6,000. And let's not forget, these were all only using fission explosions, which is where some conventional explosives compress some highly radioactive bullshit into one place so that there's a runaway nuclear reaction. But we later figured out a version of doing this with yet another layer involved so that the fission reaction then compresses even more bullshit and causes a fusion reaction, which is how those modern thermonuclear weapons work that can level half a country in one go. Apparently a thermonuclear pulse drive can reach, and no, I'm not kidding, 75,000 seconds of specific impulse. Not only could this thing make it to any planet in the solar system, it could pretty much just go there in a straight line rather than picking about with all this orbital mechanics shit. You could probably hit a cruise speed of like 10% of light speed in this thing, meaning this is almost certainly the easiest way of doing interstellar travel. The numbers are associated with this whole project are just hilarious. Like, each bomb in the fusion variant would provide somewhere between 5 and 10 billion horsepower. If those floating heads from Rick and Morty showed up tomorrow and they were like, show me what interstellar travel stuff you got, with the implication that they'd kill us all if we couldn't get to Alpha Centauri within the next century or something, this is absolutely the way that we'd go about getting there, I think. This is how we'd do it if we had to do it today. But if this idea is so amazing, why don't we fly everything in space with nuclear pulse drives right now? Here we are, taking just about as long as physically possible to get anything from A to B and making all of our sh** out of paper mache and bogies so it's light enough to even be able to do that, when all along we could have been building them like a cross between a submarine and a skyscraper, making the walls out of 10 inch thick steel, and bringing entire Starbuckses and McDonalds along for the ride and filling the cargo hold with bricks all in an effort to keep the weight as high as possible so that the explosions aren't so effective that they tear you to pieces. If we could have been doing this, why weren't we doing it? Well, uh, nuclear pulse drives do come with some small caveats. First off, the typical use for nuclear explosives is, let's be honest, tremendous violence. The countries that have them already kinda not a big fan of additional countries getting them, so if space travel ever became ubiquitous all over the world, and each spaceship had the equivalent of the entire modern world's nuclear arsenal inside of it, just throwing it out there, that might cause some, how would you say, geopolitical friction. Now you might think if we all just agree to use this technology responsibly then it'd be fine, hypothetically, but like, what is a responsible use of this? Early versions were intended to be ground launched, but they quickly realised that that would be a horrible idea. Turns out detonating nukes in the Earth's atmosphere blasts a lot of nuclear fallout into the atmosphere, as we spent much of the 1950s figuring out. Turns out if you work out how much fallout would result from each launch, and how many people would be within a certain radius, and how many cancers on average are caused by certain amounts of exposure, etc, etc, it all adds up to, basically, on average, you kill a guy every time you launch this thing, which is honestly fucking hilarious. I reckon they should have just lent into it and tied a guy to the launch pad, do a sort of ritual Mayan sacrifice thing to the thrust gods and get the one death over and done with. Now obviously, the one-ish death death per launch due to terminal cancers is not ideal, but they did spend some time trying to figure out if the program would be an overall force for good in the long term. Like, if this tech enables us to put giant solar arrays in space and that generates enough energy that we can do away with fossil fuels and then we're lowering pollution and we'd save many thousands of lives per year, could that be a good thing? Uh, maybe, but personally I'd always hazard against making giant real-world commitments right here and right now in return for hypothetical future benefits that may or may not actually happen and totally depend on all of our 
our assumptions being definitely 100% correct. It's like that one time when the Soviets were like, all right, boys, it's communism in time. Ukraine, give me all of your food, please. Uh, why? So we can redistribute it fairly as per the fair and glorious utopia of communism. Are you certain that's gonna work? Are you seriously questioning my fucking methods right now? Hey, listen, if communism works, it very well may be the golden retriever of economic systems. I'm just eager to make sure it really is gonna work because we do need food to survive. So I'll ask you again, are you absolutely certain this is going to work? E e yes. You hesitated for a second there. Just give me that. Jesus Christ, some people, man. I can't believe I have to work with them. And then like four million people starve to death. True story. And the moral of that story, which is probably going to make everyone on every end of the political spectrum shit out angry comments below the video, is that there's nothing wrong with shooting for the stars. Just maybe check that your idea is definitely going to work before betting everything on it definitely working. Launching a nuclear pulse drive straight through the atmosphere was not the only issue. We could have put this on top of some kind of giant conventional rocket to get it into space before we start dropping the bombs out of the back of it. But if you recall Starfish Prime, which was that one time the US blew up a nuke in space just to see what would happen, it had the fun effect of increasing the radiation in the Van Allen belts by several orders of magnitude, disabling a bunch of satellites, creating a new electron belt around the entire planet which hung around for several years, and also creating an EMP which caused electrical damage all the way over in Honolulu which was about one and a half thousand kilometers away from where the explosion was. So yeah, that's what happens when you do one nuclear explosion in space in the middle of the Pacific, about as far away from everyone and everything as possible, and it still did that. Now times that problem by a thousand for every single time that we launch one of these things and you might be able to see the issue. Well anyway, in 1959 NASA decided that, at least in the near term, they wanted to keep their space program totally non-nuclear anyway. Ultimately the partial test ban treaty was signed off by the USA in 1964, which was pretty much the final nail in the coffin for the concept of nuclear pulse propulsion, at least for the foreseeable future, foreseeable enough that none of the folks alive at the time would see a concept come through to fruition. It's a shame really because the nuclear pulse drive concept has such a huge amount of potential. I feel like we could add a clause to the treaty saying, but maybe go for it if it's definitely for peaceful transportation purposes and doesn't come within 100,000 kilometers of the Earth. If we could get one of these things far enough out that it's outside the Earth's magnetosphere and the Van Allen belts before we turn it on, I feel like that wouldn't do any harm. Space is full of radiation anyway, right? Like, am I retarded? Pretty sure that'd be fine. Anyway, there you have it. Project Orion. Very nice. Very cool. You know how all the iconic retro futuristic art from the 1950s all have a man wearing a suit and a woman in a kitchen and you just know for a fact that the toaster and the oven and maybe even one of the children are just filled with uranium rods? Project Orion is pretty much that mentality in rocket form, which is pretty hardcore. All right, that'll do it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Like and subscribe if you want. Thanks again to Elite Level Channel member Thunderbolt 22A10. He's developed his own branch of kung fu where he just stands menacingly and emits sonic waves from his mouth that cause people's brains to explode out the back of their heads. And big thanks to all my other channel members. If you're still watching, feel free to join the channel too. I've got a bunch of cool membership perks if you're into that kind of thing. As always, I'll catch you in the next one. Over and out.